Welcome to our midweek worship service at First United Methodist Church in Warren. The scripture for today comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians um, in chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, do not Consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us, then, who are mature be of the same mind, and if you think differently about anything, this, too, God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have obtained. Brothers and sisters, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation that it may be conformed to the body of his glory by the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I was passing time while reading a magazine, uh, I was actually sitting in a doctor's office. The article was an interesting one about a herd of African elephants in an attempt to thin out the herd. The authorities killed off a number of the older males and moved a group of females and young bulls to another area. It was not too long after the move that white rhinos in that area were being killed, not by poachers, but by the young bulls that were trying to prove their elephanthood. One elephant even organized a, a gang that began attacking tourist buses that came to view them. And to solve the problem, the authorities shot some of the troublemakers, but then came up with a, a better solution. They released a few old males from an, another area into that troubled group. The older males immediately began to bring the young bulls into line. It would appear that the young elephants did not know how to act in their day-to-day -day living without an example of the older elephants to teach them. Learning by example is not restricted to the animal kingdom. 
just as the elephants needed an example to follow so that they knew how to behave in their day-to-day -day living, so also we need an example to follow in our day-to-day -day Christian living. In the Word of God before us today, Paul encourages us to follow his example in Christian living. He tells us, do not be focused on earthly things, but be focused on Jesus and heavenly things. The Apostle Paul said to his fellow Christians in Philippi, join with others in following my example. Can you even imagine being able to say that to people without sounding conceited? Now, I would never say follow my example. After all, I know me. I, I know enough about me that I, I don't feel comfortable having people watch me closely enough to see what kind of example I might set. But Paul isn't conceited. He's not being proud. When he said follow my example, he, he could say it sincerely because what he meant was follow my example as long as I am following the example of Jesus. One morning in 1888, Alfred, the inventor of dynamite, uh, the man who spent his life amassing a fortune from the manufacture and sale of weapons, awoke to read his own obituary. The obituary was printed as a result of a simple journalistic error. Alfred's brother had died, and a French reporter carelessly reported the death of the wrong brother. Any man would be disturbed under the circumstances, but to Alfred, the shock was overwhelming because he saw himself as the world saw him. The dynamite king, the weapon maker, was what was mentioned. The great industrialist who had made an immense fortune from explosives. This, as far as the general public was concerned, was the entire purpose of his life. At least, that's what the obituary said. None of his true intentions to break down barriers that separated people and ideas were recognized or even given serious consideration. He was quite simply in the eyes of the public a merchant of death and for that alone he would be remembered. As he read his obituary with shocking horror, he resolved to make clear to the world the true meaning and purpose of his life. That could be done through uh, the uh, distribution of his fortune when the time came for him to pass. His last will and testament would be the expression of his life's ideals. And the result was the most valued of prizes given to this day to those who have done most for the cause of world peace, the Nobel Peace Prize. That caught my eye because I at times wonder how it would read if my obituary suddenly appeared. Think about it. What's your life known for? What will you be remembered for? A group of people called Judaizers were trying to worm their way into the congregation and undermine the gospel message that Paul had brought to the Philippians. Judaizers were Jews or, or, or Gentile converts to Christianity who claimed to believe in Jesus as their Savior, but they also taught that in addition to believing in Jesus, it was necessary to keep certain ceremonial laws that God had given to Israel. Basically, the Judaizers confused law and gospel. Paul appealed to the Philippians to choose the right example to follow in their Christian lives. Paul said, take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. God blessed the Philippians with some wonderful examples. God had given them Timothy and other Christian leaders. These men whom God appointed as apostles and pastors would be only examples to the congregation needed to learn about Christian living because they lived according to the word of God. They were faithful, in other words. Anybody teaching something other than the gospel was an enemy. And they should be avoided because they weren't living for Christ. The very thought of people who claimed to be followers of Jesus but who lived contrary to the gospel physically brought tears to the eyes of Paul. Paul writes, For as I have often told you before now and say, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, their mind is on earthly things. 
Throughout the scriptures, we're told repeatedly not to be caught up in things of the world. The world teaches us that we are to be selfish, we're to be self-centered. Anyone who subscribes to that way of thinking has placed his or her own desires above God. Money, possessions, pleasure, they, they all become God's. They've made, as Paul said, their stomach their God. Their only wish is to fill their sinful appetites. Things like gluttony, greed, drunkenness, sex, sexual immorality. Um, those are the appetites of our sinful nature, demands that need to be satisfied. Now just look around. What do you see in the world? You see people who, who find glory in their shame. You find, you find adultery being committed and then people boasting about their sexual conquest. You see, see other, other selfish attitudes being, being rewarded in the world, in the business world. What we once called sin is now considered uh, just different strokes for different folks. They're not uh, condemned as sins any longer. Things God has expressly forbidden because the Bible has, has clearly stated to us, we have rationalized a way. But everyone who chooses to live this way, according to Paul, is an enemy of Christ. No one is, is neutral. We need to remember that. There, there is no such thing as the middle of the road. I, either you're for him or you're against him. There, there's no straddling the fence. And, and what is the end of those who are enemies? Well, Paul tells us the destiny is destruction. Focusing on earthly things only leads to destruction. Satan uses things in the world to draw us away from Christ and the way that Jesus desires for us to live. Jesus wants us to live according to his will. The only way we can do this is to be focused on him and heavenly things. Focusing on Jesus and heavenly things is a major part of our Christian lives. The enemy of the cross lives for the world and its pleasures. Those things are earthbound and world-oriented, and that's not the way Christians are to live. As Paul reminds us, our citizenship is in heaven. Charles Swindoll once wrote that uh, the safest road to hell is a gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity and middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather for the devil. Now, perhaps in, instead of thinking about what our lives are like today, we would do well to consider where our hearts will be in the future. It was at a conference in 1984 that Billy Graham asked this question. What will you be like as a Christian 10 years from now? Many will be walking with Christ and serving him in various capacities around the world, but, but for others, there will be a tragedy because 10 years from now, they will have lost their burning zeal and love for Christ. Not necessarily because they wanted to or because they set their heart in rebellion against God's will, but because they set their life by a worldly agenda. Then Christ and his great commission will gradually dim. It's not coincidence that Paul uses the phrase for the believer as becoming a citizen of heaven. Citizen of heaven is more than a phrase that has a pleasing sound. It's a term of great honor which God is pleased to bestow on us for Jesus' sake. Citizenship in Israel was highly prized in the Old Testament. Roman citizenship was highly prized in New Testament times. American citizenship is highly prized in our day. But nothing is more glorious than citizenship in heaven. The kingdoms of the world come to an end. Citizens of this world have to switch allegiance as their rulers and governments change. But the citizen of heaven belongs to a kingdom that will never end and never change. It stands firm and sure, for Jesus is defending it and those in it. The citizen of heaven will not have his citizenship taken from him, nor will his citizenship end when he dies. 
the blessing of citizenship in heaven is that it, its citizens are, are redeemed. They are the people to whom God has granted his mercy in Christ. They are people who have been delivered from condemnation and destruction, things that, that will fall the enemy. Rather than being separated from God as foreigners and strangers, because of Christ, we become fellow citizens with the saints and members of the family of God. We ought to prize our citizenship. It's not some, something that we can achieve or merit by our own efforts, but it is a, a citizenship awarded by the grace of God. We are citizens of heaven because Jesus won a place for us there by his atoning death on the cross. He sealed it in heaven by his resurrection from the dead. And he ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us until he returns. If you pay attention to, to uh, the, the world around us, the news uh, almost daily, it's depressing. Numerous examples of, of, of anger and frustration and greed and immorality, hatred, violence, out and out anti-Christian bigotry rear their head regularly. Keeping focused on Jesus and heavenly things while we live in the world that wallows in sin and is opposed to God's word is difficult. So to help us keep focused, Paul reminds us that we are really only waiting for Jesus to return. Paul writes, we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious one. The sin of the world will one day come to a crashing end and Christ, the great king and judge, will appear. He will deal righteously with a sinful and rebellious humanity and only those will escape who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. That is only the ones who believe in Jesus as God's appointed sacrifice. Jesus will appear to all believers as a, as a judge, but as our savior and a glorious Lord, even more importantly. He will rescue us from this world. He will take us with him to the land which we have never seen, but is actually our home. And this will be a complete deliverance, not only from the evil influences of the world, but also from its evil effects. Each day we remain here, we feel those effects, the, the quarreling, the strife, the division, the disappointment, the frustration, the anxiety, the worries, the fears, the sickness, pain, and weakness. But when Christ comes to deliver us, all that's changed. But for the present, we're still here on earth. And God has a reason for keeping us here for a while. It's our time of grace during which God has graciously called us to a life of repentance and faith. It's also a time of opportunity, a time to bring that same gospel invitation to those in darkness. But while we work and wait, we turn our thoughts heavenward, keeping focused on Jesus and heavenly things. Then when God calls us home or Jesus returns in all his glory, we can stand before our righteous judge confident that we have stood for him. What a joy that will be. Amen.